Hello everybody and welcome to the Film Fan Theories Iceberg Tier 2 Part 2. Now, I just want to say thank you guys so much for all the support. It's mean, meant a lot to me. People have been just very nice and very supportive and I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, yeah, let's just get right in to the, uh, the iceberg, get right into Tier 2, specifically Tier 2, Part 2. Let's do it. Bruce Campbell is Mysteria. So the Raimi trilogy is you know, legendary, we all know that. And it's clear they had a direction uh, that they were going to go in after Spider-Man 3. Uh, Spider-Man 4 was well uh, planned out. Uh, it's just that essentially the studio didn't see eye to eye with Raimi, which is often the case, you know. But you know, at least they got to do three really good films. Uh, but with Spider-Man 4, you know, they even had plans uh, for villains for the script and they went through many revisions that they almost you know uh, from the studio uh, almost did uh, and almost went through with it because obviously the studio wasn't happy with how spider-man 3 was um, they even actually made a game which there are many youtube videos of people playing it it's very early in development but it was it was, looks really good uh, one of the main things, and one of the things that even Raimi said himself that he wanted to do, was make Bruce Campbell Mysterio. Now, throughout the entire trilogy, we see Bruce Campbell playing different roles, different random citizens and people that uh, Peter comes into contact with. He plays that maitre d', he plays the, in, in Spider-Man 2, he plays the waiter in Spider-Man 3. I can't remember if he plays anyone in Spider-Man 1. But it's clear that something's going on there. You know, you've got this guy who's just popping up in Peter Parker's life. And I suppose it would be a bit more plausible if, like, you know, the guy had the same job or he had the same personality. But he's, like, kind of different with each one, I think, uh, in Spider-Man 3. He's, like, pretending to be a French guy. It's a fucking meme. As Spider-Man 3 is, well, all the Spider-Man films are. Yeah, basically, Sam Raimi confirmed it to be the case. And it's sort of like... Uh, way back in tier one uh the merchant is the genie thing where it's like you know the the creator comes straight out and says yeah we were planning to do that but we just didn't end up doing it so yeah really cool it would have been really cool to see mysterio in this mysterio in this world and to see that payoff because it's one of those uh really cool setups in a film series in anything uh, well not in anything but it's just an interesting i guess easter egg in anything one of the best easter eggs in the marvel universe uh and in his films which is saying a lot considering there are quite a few easter eggs in uh sam raimi's films from what i what i know but yeah uh would have been really cool to see this one it's a shame that uh spider-man 4 wasn't made uh i hope they're able to make a new spider-man film with sam raimi obviously he did doctor strange and the something what is it again i forgot can't remember the specific name multiverse doctor strange film and it, that was really good um and they're you know obviously marvel's working with them so uh i think they actually might be working on something i think there was some chatter about it uh and i'd love to see the amazing spider-man 3 you know after spoilers for the amazing spider-man films gwen's death and uh uh, Peter, Andrew Garfield's Peter becoming quite vengeful because, you know, I love me some vengeful stuff, you know, the Batman, of course, had to mention my, my favorite, one of my favorite films, uh, perhaps my favorite film at this point, uh, in, in the episode, because I have to mention every episode, okay, I have to mention it, okay, good, okay, I'm happy, we, I'm happy we're on the same page, but yeah, this one's really cool, I wish it was the case, yeah, hope they do something with this. Owen Grady is the kid from Jurassic Park 1. So in the very beginning of uh, Jurassic Park 1, the very first Jurassic Park film by obviously none other than Steven Spielberg, one of the movie brats, which we also discussed in one of the last videos, um, is legendary, especially the beginning of the film. It's very Spielberg-esque where, you know, they're in this sand dune-ish environment and it's quite unrelated to the main story and it's sort of setting up uh the characters and sing up sort of the rest of the film but it's not really related to the film the the events and basically there's a kid who uh 
Dr. Alan absolutely destroys in the beginning of the original Jurassic Park. And people think that the guy from Jurassic World, whose name is Owen Grady, who's played by Chris Pratt, uh, is basically him. Uh, because, like, he almost, like, you could say he wanted to, like, uh, he was so intrigued in that film that he wanted to become, you know, like Dr. Allen and did so and, you know, worked with uh, dinosaurs and everything more. But yeah, I think they actually disproved this. And I'm not sure if there is actually an origin sort of story because I've not seen Jurassic World, any of those films. It's interesting to think like that he would start this path. Uh, just to disprove Dr. Allen and almost to to get him back, you know. Again, going back to Kevin McAllister as Jigsaw, which I watched Saw last night. It was really good. It was really interesting to make that connection when watching it because it's really interesting to see how people could change and could become something different in the subconscious between the films and between the gaps and investigating those little bits in between. But yeah, this will just be in everyone's head canon. I'm pretty sure it's not true. I think I saw something where the I don't have anything here uh reporting live on uh, my my co-hosts have not uh, have you, you've not given me the all the information. Uh you're fired. Uh you're never going to work in this town again. Um Anyway, I'm pretty sure it's not true, but would have been dope. Would have been really cool. You know, we can dream. Blank is a scroll. So because of the inclusion of the scroll in the MCU, which uh, was jump started, I think in Far From Home and spoilers, Nick Fury being a scroll in um, those films or like the, the subsequent films or previous films. Uh, it's really interesting because, you know, I, I personally think it's quite like frustrating because there's no real hint and setup and it just feels quite cheap at least in terms of the mcu not in terms of spider-man because i don't think they really chose to reveal that they didn't you know john watson choose to like you know reveal that part of his character which i think it was revealed in that film but it just felt yeah it just didn't feel right but essentially this says this theory poses the idea that um happy hogan maria hill uh, Sharon Carter and all these other people could be scrolls, and you know with like Sharon Carter for example kind of Happy Hogan like Happy kind of is quite different uh, like he acts very different but I mean like you, you're just throwing away character arcs for like the sake of like oh my god what if he's a scroll it's just like well you know what I mean like just let the guy have a fucking arc let him have a character arc you know um, like Happy Hogan for example is the best example for that people saying he's a scroll it's like, you're just taking away, and spoilers for No Way Home, the facts that aren't made out. You're taking that arc away and that his reaction to that and his character growing and, and you know, becoming, becoming a bit more likable, becoming a bit more gentle and forgiving and just a nicer guy in general uh, and a, just a better person. You're taking that and also his loss like you know tony stark's loss and his grief for, for that and then subsequently aunt may and his relationship kind of building up with peter a bit you're taking that and you're just squashing it just because oh it'd be cool if he was an alien sucks right like some of these sharon carter okay fair enough because like she was like kind of uh chill with captain america i think wasn't she in uh civil war and everything i think it was Civil war um again the reason i keep you know, saying, oh, I think it was this thing as that is because I'm not an MCU buff. Uh, I have watched them and some of them are absolutely amazing. Uh, I wouldn't say absolutely amazing. Actually, eh, yeah, they're pretty, they're really good. It's kind of like the harness force sensitive one where it's just like, oh, this would be cool. But also the majority are just like, um, no, this is just going to fucking swallow just because you think it's kind of cool. Peter Parker is in Iron Man 2. So during the climactic fight in Iron Man 2, we sort of see a kid uh, amongst the chaos, amongst the fight, just sort of reacting to what's going on and quite shocked and sort of frozen for a minute. It's quite shocked and, and frozen just in time for a minute, just out of, you know, shock. Uh, and given the fact that uh, Peter Parker is such a big fan of Tony Stark, and since he probably would have been around that age uh, in the timeline of Iron Man 2, 
timeline, it would make sense that that was Peter Parker all along. And, you know, since he's a big fan, uh, it would make sense why he is. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is really cool. I'm not a big fan of the Iron Man, Spider-Man relationships in the films because I think it takes away from Peter a bit, but it also makes sense given the fact that, you know, he's missing not only parents, but also any sort of father figure since, you know, I don't know when, uh, uncle, I don't know when his uncle dies, but yeah, and his parents, yeah, uh, it's really cool that this could have been in there and could have actually been, because the thing with the MCU and it's fallen off, uh, sort of after Endgame, um, and a bit before with some things, like I said, with the scrolls, is that they're really good at setting up things and uh, knowing uh, what they're going to do in the future to then go, ha ha ha, we well, had it, he was there all along, and everyone's like, oh, <laughs> see what you did there? Oh, ooh. that was uh, clever. Yeah, no, it wasn't it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't it. Yeah, we, we knew. We know what we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Oh, clever, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, cool. And just you know, I don't know why Marvel just doesn't come out and say, yeah, this this is this is canon, because it's like there's literally nothing to disprove it. And his face is covered. We can't hear him. Uh, you know, if he has like an if he were to have like a Boston accent or something or like a silly accent from like a, like a well not silly accent but just a completely different accent, we can't hear him and we can't see him. So like, there's no way to disprove his identity in that. So just come on, Marvel, just say, oh yeah, he he was Peter Parker. You might as well. Rick Deckard is a replicant. The themes of both Blade Runner. The major themes of both Blade Runner films is that of what it means to be human and subsequently identity. Who are we? What do we represent? What does being human represent? Right? Therefore, this theory is very, very valid and isn't really even a theory. It's almost like a part of the Blade Runner experience. Wondering, you know, is Rick? Deckard actually a replicant? The facts are there and the questions uh, are really, really quite valid. The theory is quite valid. There are just so many points that would point, there are just so many points that would make this more clear and actually be valid. For example, obviously his co-worker. God, I can't do anything, can I? For example, Gaff knowing when major life events happens to Rick Deckard is very, very weird, almost like he has been there and knows exactly how it goes because he's a replicant. You could put this down to him just being wise, but him knowing exactly when those things happen and putting the origami there and basically almost nudging, it's like almost nudging Rick Deckard to go, I'm going to do, it's going to try to do Harrison Ford. You guys know how that goes, uh, but we're, we're going to go for it. Maybe we are, maybe we are a repl replicant. Now, Maybe I'm a replicant. Um, you got to you sort of move the mouth up a bit. That is a trick, all right, everybody. So I don't want to hear any, you know. And I think he's older as well. He looks older, Gaff. Uh, so that would make sense that he would know he's a replicant because obviously he would have been there when he was created by Tyrell. Um, so it would make a lot of sense. I think Ty is Tyrell the one in the original Blade Runner or is that the one in Blade Runner 2049? I haven't seen either of them in a while, which is a shame because Blade Runner 2049 is probably my favorite film of all time. The comment about all of this was by Vicken1976 on Reddit. Uh, however, the original poster of the thread, uh, The Walking Thread, poses some arguments against this. One of them being that Deckard isn't nearly as strong as the other replicants. If you look at the end fight, the main replicant he's fighting, played by Rutger Hauer, absolute legend, rest in peace to him, uh, he's actually so strong, compar especially compared to Deckard, that obviously he's ripping through walls, he's like breaking through, you know, anything he can get his hands on, and obviously could have easily killed Deckard. Uh, I mean, his only the only reason he didn't is because of his choice to to sort of 
spare him out of realizing almost how precious life is, I think. So because of that, you know, it wouldn't make sense that he's a replicant because he would have a lot of strength and he'd be able to easily fight Rutger Hauer, uh, his character. I keep forgetting his character name, but um, that's one of them. Uh, there's also the fact that he was retired at the beginning of the film, even though uh, obviously replicants never get tired. Um, perhaps, perhaps he was retired because he was sick of the job. He was sick of living like that, which would line up with his character. So I don't think that one's as strong as like, you know, the first one or the next one. Also, there's obviously the, the idea, you know, that he lives longer, which he does. Obviously, replicants have a, a much shorter lifespan, but Deckard has clearly lived longer. And I think it kind of goes for Gaff as well. I'm not sure how old Gaff is, but Ga Gaff looks pretty old. And, you know, given how young all the replicants look, I mean, they're not, they don't look too young. There's the one that uh, killed that police officer. He didn't look too young, but I'm not sure how, like, if they're born looking older, perhaps. So yeah, obviously there are lots of points for and against this, but I think ultimately it's a very, very good theory that really kind of cracks Blade Runner open a bit and really lends itself to the themes of the film and the introspection that comes with watching the film. Ghost sightings. So if you're anything like me, which I'm sure you are because you're watching this, uh, but if you're not, that's completely fine, of course, you are a visual sort of perceptive person analyzing every frame every shot and lots of that analysis comes with discovering things that people really haven't either dis discovered themselves or haven't figured out um or they have and have created a theory like this of course which is the numerous ghost sightings uh in films i i'm not completely sure what this uh I'm not completely sure what they mean by ghost sightings, but I'm assuming what they mean is ghost sightings in films, uh, if that makes sense. So like ghost sightings in the background of films that they happen to catch because they were filming it. I'm uh, at least assuming that's what they mean. Well, the Probably the most famous is Three Men and a Baby, where you can see in the background of a shot what looks like a person peering out uh, towards the main actors. T Ted Danson is actually in that scene, um, which is very haunting and terrifying just because of how still and, you know, human-like it looks. But it's very eerie that it happens in this, like, very out-of-context scene that's just, like, a normal scene as well, and this, like, figure is just in the corner watching. Another one would be uh, Wizard of Oz, which people say uh, has a certain thing in one of the scenes that thing being a basically hanging munchkin uh literally it which is literally as it sounds a munchkin hanging himself on the set of the scene in the background of one of the shots uh, because of supposedly i think what the theory uh, the the sort of lore behind why this happened was because of how they were being treated on set and the the overwork that they were going through on the set of the wizard of oz this has actually been debunked as to be a bird in the background you can even see parts of its wing and different parts of it and there's a great video that's actually debunks this theory completely there's also the ominous boom operator or ghost in the background of the ring now i'm not trying to fucking fuck with any ghosts here and say oh the boom operator and, the, and then the ghost gets pissed because it's like i'm not a fucking boom operator and haunts me I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, ghost. I don't want to fuck with anyone here. I'm just saying that's what it looks like. That's all I'm saying. Um, and I'm being serious. I don't want to fuck with any ghosts, man. But it does suspiciously look like a cast or crew member. And we all know <sighs> we got the script suit behind the fucking, you know, everyone has to be on set for some reason. Get off the set, you know. Why is the third AD's mother? Uh, you know what I mean? Get off the set. We don't need you here. I, I, and you know what annoys me is like non the, the fact that non crucial crew members still like to hang about annoys me. And I'm not trying to have a go at you guys, but you know, you're not fucking needed to be in like anywhere near the set right now. You know what I mean? It annoys me. It annoys me. And it also puts pressure on the crew. But 
and the cast. Yeah, I suspect that's simply just a boom up. Another very haunting thing is the Poltergeist production. After the production ended, I think a week after, a few weeks after, one of the cast members was unfortunately killed or died. Um, some people think that's because of the production and that the production was haunted and that it's a bit of a situation where, you know, because you're making this movie about a poltergeist, a real life poltergeist that perhaps, you know, was it was based on because I think the the film is actually based on a real real events that they obviously killed one of the main cast members. It's uh, Either way, it's absolutely awful. And I can't imagine how the parents feel and just how much was lost and taken from that kid's life. It's absolutely fucking awful. And obviously, I think with theories like this, you really need to be careful what you're talking about. You need to be respectful, uh, which I think, like, you know, some people might not be. Um, I think either way, it's awful. You know, that a kid had to be, his had his life taken. But yeah, that is also one theory that because he was part of the production, he died. I, again, I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think it takes away from the real person's death uh, in uh, at all. And I think it's quite, to, to question a death like that is pretty fucked up. A real death as well, not a character's death. So it's, it's things like that. And also, you know, you hear of... If, if we're talking about ghost sightings, also productions themselves, since we're talking about poltergeist, people claim, again, I don't believe in that, I take, think it takes away from the, the family and the real death, um, productions being haunted, such as Don Quixote. Now, Terry Gilliam tried to make this film many times, uh, His he had to go through main cast members, he had to go through storms, mudslides and stuff like that, I think as well. Um, and they had to call Force Majeure on it and end the production, which Force Majeure is basically a big force that stops production. And it's even sort of a legal thing and a thing that producers know of and are aware of and implement. So it's not just a write-off or a thing that, you know, someone can say um, and has no precedent. It has precedent and it's, it's there just to cover people because sometimes it's just ridiculous how much is stopping uh, this production from taking place, which is what happened on Don Quixote. Luckily, he eventually made it and they made it with Adam Driver and what's that guy's name? Can't remember his name. The guy from, oh, come to think of it, he was actually already in a Terry Gillen film. He was in Brazil. And who's in the two popes that guy but yeah it's absolutely crazy the amount of force that can go behind stopping something especially a film production and it really makes you think about reality and what things might be in your way of creating what you want and the coincidences that are affiliated with those you know rest in peace to that kid though and uh yeah it's just some really eerie stuff that really makes you think about life and just makes you think about a lot of things 